we want to make sure that this is a rich and healthy discussion. Um, so if you need a uh, notepad to write your questions down, see me, I'll make sure you get some, uh, you know, a pen and some paper. Um, and with that, I have the pleasure <laughs> of introducing the District 7 Councilman Chris Johnson, who is our host for this evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, and you know, I know this seems very formalized, but again, this is a community conversation, so this is um, also being recorded, so we can, um, you know, always have this to look back to as to how we're going to solve problems in the seven. So um, I will be taking off my jacket in a little bit, because again, you all who have met me you know I'm a, a very informal person, um, that, and I feel like that's always the best way that we can approach the problems that we have. So. Um, the seventh district, as we all know, is a very diverse district um, from Little Italy and its great restaurants to um, historic Union Park Gardens to the Flats uh, to Southwest. We have a lot of great neighborhoods. Um, and we have a lot of neighborhoods that are, um, some are in transition, such as the Flats, because we have a lot of development projects. So we have a very diverse district with um, varying needs depending on the neighborhoods. But what ties us together is the fact that um, as members of the 7th, um, we often do feel left behind from a lot of initiatives that the city is working on. Um, but that is changing now. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight, about some initiatives in which we're getting in the district. But um, you know, the time for the 7th has come now. Uh, so you know, with the $40 million Galleria project at the edge of our district, to the new Wegmans uh, project that is coming down on Lancaster Avenue. Um, we have a lot of interesting uh, project and investment um, now focused on our area. So it's up to all of us working together to um, try to make sure that these development projects benefit our citizens. So that's what we're going to talk about some of those initiatives working both in the 7th and citywide to solve those problems. And um, I do have Council President Hanifa Shabazz with me because even prior to me um, being on city council, we've worked together on the ground. Um, I, I was, I think, a young um, uh, upper comer in, in the Democratic Party working with Ms. Shabazz on um, solving pro problems such as voter outreach and how to get folks from low turnout uh, voter districts to come out and um, support candidates. So I've worked with Ms. Uh, Dr. Shabazz on the ground um, way prior to being on council and since I've been on council, uh, I've been able to work with um, Dr. Shabazz in a different capacity in working to solve these problems because it is important that we use a community organizer approach to solve a lot of problems we have in the 7th District. And Dr. Shabazz's background as a community activist and organizer, uh, <laughs> Hanifa, her background is very important to solving the problems as she has worked for nonprofits. Um, she's been a, a business owner in the city. She's done everything on the ground that many of us here uh, do. You know, uh, running a small business is important. And she's, um, so she knows the perspective from not just a government official, but for someone who has um, uh, worked with um, neighborhoods to try to make sure her businesses flourish. So um, Hanifa really is a partner. Uh, we've talked about these plans for years, and now I'm excited to work with her in a different capacity as a city council uh, representative so that we can make these dreams become a reality. Um, so just a little bit about uh, Hanifa's background. Those of you who don't know her, um, she is the first council, uh, female council president in um, Wilmington's history. Um, so not only is she, she's made history, but she was the first person to get the CDC to take a look at gun violence in Wilmington as a disease and a health epidemic and not just continuing to, yes, and that deserves applause. And so the CDC report that Hanifa was instrumental in bringing um, really changed the landscape um, the, when she started this four years ago. Because now we have the governor, we have the mayor, we have the congressional delegation looking at this problem as something that we, we need investment in upstream activities, not just arresting more people. So there's really a dramatic change in how we're looking at this. There's a CDC advisory group in which we're, um, Hanifa can talk about in a little bit, but we really have a lot of momentum going on this issue. Um, but what it takes is, it takes all of us. 
Because no matter what we do, what we fight for, unless all of us are working together and there's people who are screaming loud at City Hall uh, for these issues that we need, then it won't come to fruition. So uh, we're going to talk about those strategies tonight, about how we can all be involved in training. Um, some of you who may have seen the announcement, um, we are doing uh, community organizer trainings that I'm bringing to the district. It's a program that I'm working with Network Delaware in the Urban League. We're going to have trainings on November, Saturday, November 9th, November 16th, and November 23rd from 11 to 1 p.m. at the uh, Frame Boys and Girls Club. It's going to be free to attend um, the trainings, the two-hour trainings. And what it is, it's going to be an um, a, a in-depth uh, immersion into how to community organize, how to issue campaign how to write your legislators, how to get involved in the community. Because again, uh, my job as city uh, councilman is to empower the community. So I appreciate um, the flyer will be circulated soon. Um, we'll have sign-ups for that event. Uh, we, are, we do have a mass capacity, so please sign up uh, early. And um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. But without further ado, I do want to introduce council president, and she can kick us off. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chris, for that um, introduction. And, and, and thank you all for coming out today to our community conversations. And I agree, Chris, I was trying to ask staff that we have to have this formal presentation because a conversation is when we sit down and just have a conversation. And that was my goal. But because they wanted me to get it on the camera, I have to stand in front of this microphone. So if I have to bend it down, <laughs> if I sit down, you know, because um, I think it's important that uh, we have just really heart to heart good conversations about what we see that needs to be done. Um, here in the city, in our in our city, um, and so that's that, and that's taking on the position as president. I've not had an opportunity to be as engaged and out in the community as you used to seeing me, um, because you know responsibility takes on a different role. Um, but this is the part about public service that I truly love the most. Um, in my in my 12 years of being a district council member, you know I can in some of the things that you said I've been able to accomplish. Um, I've always focused my service on four E's, and that was education, empowerment, economics, and environment. And from those results, we have been able to address the um, issues that have happened in some of my lower income communities. Um, and you know, I'm proud to say that we just did the groundbreaking the other day for the wetland. And that started from our work back in 2004 or five, starting on you know, addressing the flooding that was almost devastating Southbridge. And I'm a 40 year resident of Southbridge. So, you know, I have lived it, experienced it, and fought hard with my, my residents to address that issue that has caused um, a loss of, 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 of uh, valuables, people lost their cars, houses of, of impact with mold, mold uh, which caused illnesses. And um, I'm glad to see that we are finally getting some shovels to the ground to do uh, the necessary project that $25 million project that I'm proud to say we were able to get the resources to get that done. So that now we can not only just deal with the, the flooding that's flooding South Wilmington, which will also affect our economic ability to revitalize and build in South Wilmington. So um, again, you know, my, you know, that comes from my sitting down and having deep conversations with my constituents. Um, the East Side Rising is building on the East Side with a strong workforce development program. Um, they, are, they have a, 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 a fantastic urban garden to bring fresh vegetables into a community where there's been a, a food desert. Um, their work for training program is essential with all the jobs are coming in and industries coming around us to prepare our constituents for some of those positions. Um, I'm excited about that. And then we also have the West Side Futures. And West Side Futures is also working and had a master plan of how they saw, and that's the most important part, how they saw they wanted the community to be and it's now moving from paper to actual in uh, actuality of coming to fruition. So then I became the president of council, which I'm very proud to say, um, that I'm very proud that that position, and I thank all of you who voted for me for giving me the privilege of serving you in that position. It's been an uphill battle. There's been some hiccups. There's been some hurdles. Um, but I think it's because my was wearing maybe four-inch stilettos instead of wearing flats, OK? <laughs> <laughs> But you know, that's life, and we continue to grow by life's lessons. And I just am thankful for all the life lessons that I've learned since I've been able to serve for three years. Um, but I wanted to have these conversations because um, you know, we're, we're, uh, it's important that as we are 
developing and researching legislation that we know that it's something that is going to resolve and make a better quality of life for the people that we serve. Um, I felt that it was essential that we have a strategic plan with so many new council members. We had seven new council members when we first started off. All eager, all excited, all wanting to get something done in the community. And how do you do that without a plan, with a limited amount of time, limited amount of resources, with all the different ideas, how do you best do that? So we had workshops and we, um, we huddled and we talked about things that were common across the board for all of the city of Wilmington and how could, which ones would be priorities and which ones would be that we may need to do in a third year. The he who fails to plan plans to fail and our goal was for us not to be a failure as such a young um, council but to really make a mark that we, regardless of us having so many new minds new ways of doing things, learning how you understand what the roles is, learning what the charter says, learning what the rules are, and mostly listening and learning what the people want. How do we bring that back to fruition? So there is a, uh, a, a report on the table, if you'd like to pick it up, of some of the accomplishments that we have been able to do in, in meeting that strategic plan. So feel, please feel free to pick it up, or you can also find it on our, um, on our website. I know that public safety is um, on everybody's mind first. How do we deal with public safety? And as um, Councilman Johnson mentioned, my requesting the Center for Disease Control to come into the city. Um, and understand that it, this wasn't just, we're not the first one that had the Center for Disease Control to come into our community because it also happened in lower Delaware, in southern, very southern part, of, southern part of Delaware, because there's an epidemic of young individuals there, and mostly white, low-income um, um, young youth are committing suicide in epidemic proportion. And here up north, we have mostly low-income black children committing homicide in epidemic proportion. Hmm, why is that so? And so I sent reports on, because we've done many studies on our children, on activities, on our policing. We've sent, and I sent all that information to the Center for Disease Control, and they came back with the findings. And one of the first things they told us to do was to, um, first was to, to develop a community advisory council made up of stakeholders in a holistic perspective. I mean, not only corporate, not only health, not our politicians, but community, nonprofits, all the different sectors of our society that make us up. We need to bring them at the table is what we did. Right now, we still have a good 39 organizations who've been at the table for the past three years since we, since exception, um, and we got the findings back um, to evaluate and develop recommendations on how to, uh, um, how to address the issue that the CDC said that we were suffering from. They don't give you how to do it. They just tell you what your issue is um, and give you recommendations. That was CDC, the Community Advisory Council was the first recommendation. The other was um, to do data, to create a data sharing system where all of the different departments within the state, the service, the service agencies are talking to each other. Because they found from the sampling of students that, of individuals who committed violence by gun, <coughs> what they found was all of them all had interaction with the same departments. So they had both, and the biggest department and a section where they had the most engaging interaction was the school system. And we understand what's happening with our school system, the inequitable education that our school system provides. Because we at City of Wilmington do not have a voice authoritative voice in our school system. Um, so putting a data sharing system in place, <coughs> then you know that if our child came to school and our child is having, a, 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 as we would say in the olden days, being, you know, it was a, a discipline problem. They're acting up, there's something wrong. But if you really looked into that child's life, you found <coughs> that child might not have slept for two days, that child might not have eaten, that child, that, that person coming down the hall reminded them of the person who is abusing them. And they have what is scientifically said, they have a traumatic episode. And of course, if you're not trained to be able to identify trauma when you see it in a child, we see what, you are bad, what are you doing? And send off to the, to the principal's office or, or expel them or, or, or suspend them and not ask the question, what happened to you? It's a child. What happened to you? So what we did was we trained, um, <coughs> but also, excuse me, the third was to make sure the children had a safe place to go. 
Okay, so if they're not safe at home, it's not safe at a family's house, they got a safe place to go. So we did extended care throughout these, our 18 community centers, extended hours. And then you probably heard extended hours, that the community centers stay open later, later at night and they're open on the weekends. And we trained all the individuals inside of the um, community centers, from the executive director down to the mere person, any, everyone who has interaction with our children. We trained them on trauma-informed care so they could identify when our young people was having a traumatic episode, not acting out, not being bad, not being di disciplined, but a traumatic episode. <clears throat> so these were the three findings that were said we was needed for to deal, deal, with, our, with, the, deal with the trauma that's, that's dealing with our community. And understand this trauma is not just in our children, the trauma is with us too. I'd like to recommend that all of you go online and do an ACE test, an Adverse Childhood Experience test and see how many ACEs you experience in your life and then you understand your ACE number. And then we look at that, what our children are experiencing and then you'll see why we have the situation we have. That's all I'm gonna say to WCAC. We do have a website, we have meetings that's open to the public. We encourage you to come out, participate because this is gonna take all of us. But I thought it was important because I know public safety is everybody's on the tongue on everybody as to why our children are committing such heinous crimes. It has to be an issue that's suffering from mental illness for a child to pick up a gun and to blow your head off. And I have to say this, and I'm in a room mostly of all uh, people of, 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 of Caucasian um, background, and understand that us as African American in the city of in the United States, been here over 400 years, and the oppression that we've been through, and we have not gone against our oppressor, and that we're now going against self, that there triggered to me that there was something wrong with our babies, that we're doing something wrong with it, and the CDC confirmed that. So I'm looking forward to working farther with you, talking further more about the accomplishments we've had. I thank Senator uh, Governor Carney, who has declared Delaware as a trauma-informed state. He has formed the Family Service Cabinet Council, which was a recommendation for the Women Community Advisory Council, and they're seeing the, what we have done in our uh, services that we do the state and making those necessary changes. So that's it for the CDC. Any questions? I know it's public safety. Is there any other questions anyone has about public safety? Michelle? Yeah, I just had a question. I mean, one of the, um, uh, the biggest concerns going on lately is the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. So with the opioid crisis and with um, the CDC, as you just mentioned, how is, this, is the state going to provide like, any funds for this, um, towards this program the way they have with the opioid crisis? We are continuously, I mean, that was the very, when I went down to the General Assembly, um, that was always the answer from the General Assemblyman. Where are we going to get the money from? Well, we're spending millions of dollars on service contracts for organizations to do um, treatment, RFPs, right. right, for treatment, and some preventive services. But evidently, that hasn't worked because our children would be in the condition that they're in. So we're working, one of our recommendations from the Community Advisory Council, we came up with seven recommendations was that we looked into the policies that are currently on the books that are adversely affecting the service and the lives of our children, and we make those changes. So if we have, we're spending multi-million dollars of money to agencies to provide services that are not working, I say we write the way that we do the request for, pay, uh, request for services to services that we have found evidence-based, evidence-based, okay, yeah. programs. And we, thank you. And put that money there. So really, just it's just a shift. Now we still do need the treatments because we still have children suffering from this. We have families suffering from, from certain from certain social ills. But if we could shift some of that money to intervention and prevention, then hopefully, as we keep feeding the children through the pipeline, because we recognize that our children <laughs> suffer in three levels of of this of the trauma. And the one we say, well, that's universally because of epidemic. University give every child an aspirin, every child an aspirin, right? Because we don't know how, what degree of the epidemic they're suffering from. The second was, the, the, we call them universal. Then there's um, indicated. They are indicating through triggers of things that they do, whether in school or in their families, that they have got some degree, a little higher degree. So they need not just a vitamin, but they need an, I mean an aspirin, but they need a vitamin on top of the aspirin. Okay. Then there's selected ones who have definitely demonstrated that they are about to pick up a gun and blow somebody off. Okay, blow, blow somebody away. Those are the selected ones. They need penicillin. 
So if we look at the at epidemic as a, it is an epidemic and, and feed that and, and treat our youth and our families, because it's not just the children, we adults are suffering from it as well, because everyone says it, it comes from the family. Well, the adults are suffering from it as well, so they're feeding it, and that can't help the children. So that's where the finances come in. Yes, do we need more money? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but, and we're working now on creating the data. And I want to thank Christian Wilhelm, who's here, just came in. She works, she's a, a, a working on our policy strategy component of our work with the Community Advisory Council. Um, and we're working and collecting the data to demonstrate the evidence base that our products work. Now, how many kids have to die before they realize that and give us the money that we need? I don't know if it's the same numbers that they have for the opioid thing, but I think enough of our children have died. And, and, and I just want Please. to come in, honey, because again, um, you know, this is an idea exchange. Um, and I'm just going to start to write stuff on the board so we can all visualize kind of where the main topics are every day we go to work, what we're working on. Mm -hmm. But the, the two, CDC and opioids, you have to see is interrelated. Um, and, and previously, under prior administrations, even governors, you know, the two were kind of treated separately. Gun violence was something a separate issue than how you treat the opioid addiction. But really, the two are interrelated because they're both, uh, you have to almost look at from a medical terms of how do we approach these symptoms that actually lead to um, these either drug use or lead to violence. And there are certain indicators you can look at. And it all comes back down to trauma. So, um, you know, I'm not going to bore you all, but it actually goes back to if you look at um, sexual abuse victims, um, children in foster care, children who are near gun violence. Um, they have a higher risk of both addiction, higher risk of violence, and there's just there's a lot of that is interrelated. And so that is what um, we are now working on is how to address these upstream activities and not get them in high school, but get them in middle school, even grade school. Yeah. We're fine. Um, one organization in which I've uh, been a longtime board member of is Delaware Center for Justice. We have a school diversion program where we're in the middle schools, Bancroft, you know, um, um, Palmer. You know, we're in those schools earlier and earlier because the, the, the trauma starts, you know, from the time they're three, four, five, six years old. And so now we're looking um, at, a, at a different way to approach these. And what the, I think the one caveat we have with a lot of these initiatives is for us to finally do it the right way, we will not see the results. Um, probably until another eight, 10 years down the line when these uh, youth actually become adults. And um, I think the prime example is the Harlem Renaissance Pro Program. Some of you can Google that. Harlem Renaissance was an instrumental program back in the 90s where um, you actually had investment uh, in uh, almost contracts, social contracts with uh, specific blocks in Harlem on how the families would, would cultivate their youth and engage in academic, engage in uh, education activities so that your children could grow up strong. And then they followed that program for 20 years and the results have been astounding. So we need something similar to, to that here in Delaware where we're investing from an uh, early age so that the youth can be engaged in these activities so they can grow up to, to be productive uh, women tonics. So, so we're, that, that's, we're working on the policies now and trying to do some immediately immediate um, activities to address the trauma and try to make our, our environment for our young people to grow and thrive. But there's other things that we also have to do, and I'd like to talk to you about that as well. Um, we, I, I know everyone has heard, heard um, saw the uh, announcement when Delmelva Power and Light was going around the city and putting LED lights throughout the city, which would brighten our lights. Everybody says if we got brighter lights, you know, um, a lit neighborhood, it makes it a safer neighborhood. Crimes are not done in the light, they're done in the dark. So we are, um, so I know that Del Marvin Power is working on, you know, changing all of their lights over. And then there's about 1,800 pole lights that the city of Wilmington are responsible for. Right. So we, then we are responsible for trying to make those um, pole lights to be LED as well. Well, we now currently have legislation, um, I think it came about in June, that was brought before um, Swiss Council t um, with an, a, a professional service organization that was able to help create the plan of how do we do that? How do we do it? How much is going to cost? Um, and where will we get the money? So my understanding that this entity got us, uh, found a grant through DENREC, a $2.4 million grant from DENREC so that we could change out all of our lights. And the, um, it also would give us a node on the lights that would give us broadband um, 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 uh, um, 
uh, broadband e experience as well. well. Currently, that piece of legislation is being held in a public works, and we're hoping a public works committee, and it was hoping that we would can get it out of the committee so that we can put that in place. The intention was to have LED lights through the city done by August, but there are some stumbling blocks that we're working now with to, to convince the council members to bring it out of committee so that we can take advantage of this. And also, with us turning our lights into LED lights, there would be a $200,000 savings on our utility costs. Right. Yeah. So this is essential that we get this piece of legislation out of committee so that we can take advantage and of it. And it's important that, um, so there's a theory called uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Correct. Um, a few years ago there, we actually had a community training at the Wilmington Police Headquarters um, that was free to citizens. Um, it's something I hope we can offer again. Um, it's actually McGruff, the crime dog. Um, it's, it's, it's the organization in which McGruff uh, um, is, is with. And um, the point was to educate the community on how environmental design, lighting, mm -hmm. um, cameras, that deters crime. You know, so that is why the LED program and getting this legislation through is so important. Um, and as many of you can probably attest to, um, those dark corners, those street lights that are out, um, those attract crime. So it really is through um, you know, use of shrubbery, use of lighting, use of a lot of ways we can design our parks. We can prevent crime from even happening. So that's what the focus is. I know it seems like it may not mean a lot, but it, the science <coughs> proves that you know, if you make it uh, uh, uninviting to crime, then crime will not come. So that's something that is, is, is not lost on us and we're working and getting hard to get this legislation out. Okay. You had a question, ma'am? If you're going to do this LED lighting thing Sorry. throughout the city, okay. um, they, they can't pick it up the yeah. oh, <laughs> If you're going to do the LED program in the city, can you tie in um, the canopy of the trees to bring the, tr the tree canopy above the the light because I see a lot of trees in the city that are obstructed by tree branches. And most likely that will take place and um, I did a project in the 4th District called Light Up the 4th District and I gave all of the civic associations a map of their neighborhood and where all of their street lights were. And I asked them to go to the lights and indicate on the map whether the light was out, whether it was dim, or if it was obstructed by trees. Right. Took that back to public works and they did the necessary repairs. Maybe we need to try to do that again. I think that's part of our, in our strategic plan that we would try to do that citywide, light up the, light up the city, um, because that would give us that really detailed um, community grassroots information about what light is doing, what and we know what tree need to be done. So I, I think that's something that we could probably. Because that's a huge issue huge in your issue. area, I know, mm -hmm. right, Dutch? Yeah. The street lights is, is a constant problem in terms of going out, and I think specifically in Southwest it is something that I'm making a priority because it is. Um, they, they need to be fixed, and um, you know that's that's you know even parking with residents. You know we should have uh, parking, um, you know uh, parking areas lit. So you know thank you for bringing that to our attention because it is something we're focused on. Yes, sir. Yes, my understanding is that the that the smart lights that Delmarva is going to provide uh, are going to have bulletproof lenses. Mm -hmm. And they also have got other capabilities, like they can actually, I don't know if they can actually listen in or, or what, but uh, the, the lights that you are planning to install, are they comparable to the Del Delmarva lights, or are they a lo lower level? No, on my understanding, they're very com they're comparable, because it was, a, it was a collective understanding between Delmarva and the city, that what do we do to address LED lighting throughout the entire city? Um, so one of the other things that the lights will do is it has, like I mentioned, the 5, 5G node on it that will allow the broadband um, um, yeah. inter internet um, activity. And so the goal is to try to get, we have something called Shot Spotter. Am I correct, Officer? Mm -hmm. Shot yes. Spotter? Okay, you know, that identifies where a gunfire is shot. So hopefully we could tie the cameras in, into, um, they can immediately go to where the shots fired and have a picture of it. That's, that's, I'm not promising, but I think that's what we're trying to make all happen. Okay. Um, but it's important that we get these LED lights so we have that internet um, um, opportunity. And also, that. I mean, it ties into CCTV, and I know that's probably the next um, subject we're going to talk about, the, the community cameras. Yes, um, yes, that, right. That we're working on that project, because I don't know if you want to jump right into that, because it ties right into right. LED. Right. You know, and this ties into our approach on councils. You have to be smart. 
Um, you know, we're tired of wasting taxpayer dollars in um, police manpower on things that, through simple things such as lighting, we could fix. So let's talk about the community camera program. The community camera program was, um, it's been, uh, we have a community working group, I mean camera working group, um, and what we did is looked at all of the cameras, whether they were from Downtown Visions, where they were um, the ones that we owned, also where corporations' cameras also are. How do we have a comprehensive citywide camera-focused um, program? And the result of it has been that, um, and it's directed by the police department, um, and that we bought all of the cameras that, this, that cover the neighborhoods, we brought them back into the city's police department before they were being watched by a collaboration with Downtown Visions. So we now have police officers who have an eye for seeing things over, overseeing our, our camera unit. Um, and uh, as to where their locations are going to be, we're not going to publicly say where they all are, um, but we know they're in our most high crime neighborhoods. And um, that program will be is coming, is coming on little by little. My understanding is there's 35 cameras in downtown Riverfront area and 65 and more coming into the neighborhood. Could I suggest, when, when I've heard Delmarva speak about the when I've heard Delmarva speak about these smart LED lights, they always say smart LED lights. Yes. And I would suggest to you that you consider when you talk about your LED lights, you also use the same smart LED yes, so people just don't think it's a light. Good point. Good point. Thank you very much, sir. Because they are smart. <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's important because it ties in with something that we didn't have on this list. but. Um, then we have something that we established, um, this is back when I worked in the city law department, we established the real-time crime center, similar to what Newcastle County has. So it uses um, information technology to pinpoint locations of crimes. That's why, if you all recall, the community meeting we had with uh, um, Captain Campos a few weeks ago, we talked about reporting incidents because, you know, um, we're trying to make the Wilmington police smarter. Um, not, you know, and, and there's a lot they can do just using technology. So that's why the cameras and knowing the location of crimes is so important so that we don't waste um, important manpower um, chasing, you know, chasing people around when we can just easily pinpoint what time and night they're going to come out and, and commit the crime. Because I know, especially in 7th District, it's a lot of, um, it's not necessarily shootings. That's the issue is property and quality of life issues. So it is, um, you know, what time and night are the uh, car break-ins happening? Is it 3 to 5 a.m.? on Wednesdays or is it more Thursday and the more data we have easier we can pinpoint exactly um, where we need to um, concentrate the sector police so that we can actually get these arrests and deter folks from coming back around and breaking into cars. And smarter officers mean not miss by that. We mean smart because we give it a smart technology. I just want to get that. There's more resources. More resources. More resources. But as, I mean, look, and, 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 uh, as, as Council President Hanifa will not say this, but um, my perspective is we have enough officers in the city. Um, we have more than enough officers in the city. Um, in fact, if you look at the safest communities in the nation, they don't have more officers. It's the officers that are well resourced and smart because that's the way we, we, we're going to solve these crime issues. Um, if them, you know, knowing where to drive and when to drive, that's going to help solve the issues, especially in our district. Is that, again, these, a lot of these um, crimes are fueled by these top two issues we already talked about, right? You know, opioids and then these kids not really having other options. They're going through and roaming through the neighborhoods. So these are issues that you know we see as interrelated, and we're working to make the Wilmington Police Department uh, smarter. And I believe they they have had a little drop in the ranks, and I know they are looking for a new academy class next year um, because we've had a lot of retirement. So we do want them to be a full staffing. But again, I don't think we need a overwhelmingly more police. At least that's my perspective. I believe we need to work to make sure that they have the resources that they need. And with the, I, the, with the use of the word smart, I mean, I'm, I've been a strong advocate. I've been advocating for at least two years now to make Wilmington 5G, to get us on Google 5G. And I know it's coming slowly and surely. Um, and so as we continue to build that framework of 5G in the city of Wilmington, that we'll be able to know um, if we see cost savings, our water fountains, we know when the water needs to turn off because of weather conditions. Uh, we know if there's an issue in the side of town, we can brighten up those LED lights 
You know, so there's a lot of things that we can do in becoming 5G, and also there's a lot of data that we can collect that would make also, obviously, you can make another revenue stream for us because that's the way the world's going. But we're working on that one as well. <laughs> Um, any other questions regarding that? Because I want to move on to, um, I know Council Member Williams before did legislation um, for the off-highway vehicle legislation. And um, that's been put into effect and it's given our, our police department a, another um, tool by which to address that. Because you know we can't, ca you can't chase them. But now the legislation that was passed is that if the, if the, uh, bicycle, the vehicles are found and they're not properly um, registered, Tagged or on a, um, I can't think of on a, um, hmm? trailer. That's trailer. the word, trailer. And this is and this is ATV. Yeah. That's the more common. Name. ATV. If they're not on a trailer, um, then that gives the police officers the ability to confiscate them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're doing what we can. We'd love to be able to find a place that they can go play. Yeah. Right. We'd love to find a place. Um, there was a place in Newark. We researched a place in Newark. Because one time I even thought about, we know we have the Wilmington um, Housing Authority property in South Bridge. That's torn down. It's nothing but roads. But now it's a solar plant place. But the issue is, who's going to take the liability? We're self-assured. Sure. And so there was a place in Newark, and they said that's why they had to close down, because it's um, other, other insurance liability. Well, I mean, not to get us off task, but I'm just curious, is there, um, oh, sorry. Um, is there any coordination with the, like the Boys and Girls Clubs and Police Athletic Leagues? Because I know from what I've heard, you know, a lot through the many different communities is that, you know, these, a lot of these kids don't have anything to do after school or, you know, and that's maybe sports or some sort of activity centers, uh, re-engaging them. I, I know it's not easy. A lot of those places don't have huge budgets, but uh, maybe some sort of transportation system around the neighborhoods to pick pick kids up and drop them back yeah. off. I, I don't know, I'm just going to... Well, there is um, efforts being done through the Wilmington Community Advisory Council. Um, in fact, we had a meeting with County Executive Matt Myers regarding um, how we could possibly get transportation for young people to go to our safe havens. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're all working on that because all the community centers don't have all the different kinds of services. And that's one thing, too. We didn't just want our community service to serve community centers to be open late at night, but we wanted to them have po positive youth developing programming taking place, not just basketball. Because mm -hmm. um, everybody's not into basketball, but there's other things that we see. I mean, they stimulate their minds, and um, so we are trying to, we partner with other organizations to host their, their youth positive programming in the community centers. And if there might be something going on in one center and a child is on the other side of town, so if we can get this transportation where we'll be able to pick them up and take them to the various locations that would keep them off the street, it would keep them engaged. So we're, we are trying to, we need you on the Women's Community Advisory Council with that kind of idea. That's <laughs> and, and actually, I, bringing that up and connecting of services, I recently um, just again um, met with Rachel at Boys and Girls Club, Rachel Kane, and we talked about the same very issue. Is the problem is connecting the residents to the actual yes. uh, community centers. So there are a lot of activities, but unfortunately, if you talk to anyone at the community centers, they're underutilized because there's not a direct connection between the services out there and getting the kids there. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge problem we face in uh, both Wilmington and other cities face the same problem: is letting the 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 the, the kids know, and the families know that the resources are there, and also trans uh, transporting them if they have a parent that's not willing to do it, making sure they can get there. And that's a huge problem that we're trying to still work on is uh, connecting uh, the kids with services. If they have an art program and frame that a kid wants to do, but they live on the east side, they should be able to get to that program. And, and what we have done, and I'll be giving you speak to next, um, what we have done is looking now, and there's any children, any youth that are watching this, and you know about any youth that like to be engaged, we are trying to get youth on the, more youth on the way with the Community Advisory Council so they can assist us on how we could get the word out or how we might can do it differently, because we, we accept the fact that we see things different from a different lens than our youth. And so in order, how can we help them if they're not at the table telling us how to do it, what language to use, how to advertise it? We might not be saying it cool enough for them to really grasp it, you know? So if we, we're working now on, on recruiting young people to be at the table more with us. And we haven't done this whole work without youth being engaged, but we need them more engaged because now we're in the implementation stage of these programs and that we definitely need their voice. So they can say it cool like they would understand. They, you know, because they think, you know, I mean, one word I know they say is, 
Is that pro what, 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 which are the lit programs? You know, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to talk cool like the kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it very well. Yes, she sir. used to talk real cool. Too, by the way. <laughs> I hope I still do. <laughs> um, you know, we, I'm one and part of, and also part of the First T program. Yeah. So we have a First T program and uh, and three different golf courses. And what we want to uh, and instill into our kids, everybody's not going to be a Michael Jordan. And we don't want 24-hour basketball courts around the city because we want to aspire to do something different. So I was hoping uh, with West Center City and some of the other um, places that we could have some of my kids go to the first tee program. We start at 5 and go to 7.30. And we have in excess of 375 kids at the three or four different locations. So I asked uh, Kevin Kelly, Kevin's not here, uh, to maybe we can send a, or somebody can bring our kids to Porky Oliver's, yeah. uh, Rock Manor, and, and places such as that. And we have instructors, and we teach them not only about golf, but about life skills. Before, so, before, before you go to another subject, what you gonna answer? Yeah, I, I was just gonna say th th thank you for, for that uh, input because it is important, I think, that we look at other ways because as uh, Hanifa said, it's more than basketball now. Um, I mean, esports, e gaming is the big thing. It didn't exist when I was growing up, or many of you growing up. And so that's the thing. I'm sure that is. Esports, I guess they. <laughs> it's online and they, they win big money. But that's. The kids are into that. So we have to find a way to integrate that into what we offer the children. Right, but what I was going to say is understanding that the, those types of services, support services, youth services, is a function of the state. Okay, so for the city of Wilmington to find the resources to do that outside of our purview. But I have to say that we have great partners in the state. Um, to, um, um, Dr. Walker, the Secretary of, of um, Youth De Department of Health and Social Services, has been a major, major advocate for us. Um, so it's just changing what we've been doing for so long in a, a different way. And the worst part about it, we need them to, sw to change instantly because our children are dying, but life doesn't go that way. So, you know, I would welcome you to come to our meetings um, and become a collaborative partner. Because the WCSC doesn't do services. We partner with individuals who do the services to make things come. And I think the, the team warehouse is, is an offspring from the work for the Women's Community Advisory Council. The community intervention team is an offspring from our work. So we would love for the T first, first team first to be a part of it as well. So and, it's, and that's um, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Again, mm -hmm. and I wish all year round. And I share with you the different dates of our meetings because we're now doing we're in we're in um, committees doing different parts of our work, and I don't have that schedule in my head, but okay. I would like to share it with you. Okay. Um, you wanted to get the word out, and you said the common thing is for the to get the word out. The common thing is they all go to school, mm -hmm. so to have some kind of um, announcements at school to you know find out what kids are interested in what and find and and I think that would be an excellent way. Thank you. you add that to the list of Thank you. Um, I did want to jump to because um, we, we have a lot of issues, hard hitting issues, but I want to stick on the public safety theme. I did want to talk a little bit about Union Street and parking and traffic in our district. Um, this is I know a source of aggravation for a lot of folks, especially business owners. Um, and we are continually looking at ways to improve Union Street. Um, you know, definitely, you know, I know the, um, the, the recent bike lane project, you know, there were some uh, benefits, a lot of great benefits to our neighborhood, um, but it's also changed the dynamic in terms of business community. Um, so that's something that we are continuing to look at, um, you know, in terms of how we can reintegrate um, maybe some more direct end parking. I am open to different ways to, to, to looking at it. Um, but I have heard from the business community that is, um, it, it is not the favorite. Um, and so um, the diagonal parking is something that, uh, you know, it will take a budget cycle where, you know, we can look at um, getting funding to um, making some changes. But it's important that I know, at least from the um, business and resident perspective, how we can improve Union Street. And then kind of dovetailing off of that, the rest of parking, I know um, in certain neighborhoods there's always parking disputes and issues and that's why um, we are going to do the community organizer training and I'm re trying to re-engage the civic associations as well um, a lot of other disputes neighbor to neighbor disputes things like that 
Um, they can easily be solved if we have active civic groups. Um, I know I'm working in UPG, Little Italy is next, um, as well as Southwest and, and the rest of the district in terms of re-energizing the civic associations. Because a lot of those problems um, doesn't necessarily take a legislative fix, but um, we all just have to be good and respectful neighbors. And so a lot of these community mediation programs are something that um, we will be doing more of. Um, you know, more details will come, but it's something where, um, you know, where people are parking and people are parking on the sidewalk, things like that should not be happening in, in places where people care for each other. So that's, um, we have a lot of homeowners in our, in our district, and so we want to have a certain kind of uh, community. So that's, I think, from the parking perspective, I'm open to those changes. Are there any comments on parking, union, or not on union? Well, I'm not quite parking, but Definitely the state of our street. Mm -hmm. We have like, potholes, people avoiding potholes. I'm sorry, just the, um, the actual state of our streets. Um, there are a lot of potholes, um, and we've had a lot of construction done, and the streets have been tore up and resurfaced, but they're not resurfaced according to, from what I understand. Um, if they do resurfacing, they're supposed to do it all the way out to the whole half of the street, or if I, if I remember correctly from a city council meeting, that's how the uh, transportation said they're supposed to do it. But that's not what they're doing on this side. And we have a lot of um, people avoiding potholes and the construction and the resurfacing is horrible. Um, we just need to get that addressed and get it. That's a, a big issue. And, and so that's important because, um, you know, I think we, we talk a lot about subject, but our job is to uh, make sure that the city is clean, make sure it's safe, and that the roads are taken care of, the trash is picked up. Um, and a lot of uh, issues like that, definitely, um, and, and, and what area do you live in, ma'am? Okay, so um, those specific issues, again, that's why we're restarting a lot of civic associations, because I want the civic associations to get them first, and then we're going to have a, a pragmatic way that we can address these issues street by street, working with um, Del Dot and Public Works make sure our, our city streets are taken care of. But I also want to share too that um, we have, the, our public works has a street, um, our street department program on how they're going to resurface and take care of our potholes in our, in, our, in our city. And right now they're two years, two years behind? They're two years behind. And we passed legislation that um, we put in our band, the, the bond of anticipation note, um, the, requirements and monies for not just two years of, because we always didn't get up at the end of the year, we run out of money. We got more street than we got money. So what we, we passed legislation that we would not do it just for the, the, just two years, but we also were able to get the next two years. So we have four years worth of um, monies in our bond anticipation note so that we can try to get caught up in our street repair. Um, so we do know that we have that issue, but it takes money to do so. And um, I'm proud that this, that this, this a body of council for the first time ever encouraged the administration to go at for two term two segments of money in the in, at one time so we don't get to the end of the season and run out because that's the only way happening so hopefully we'll be able to get caught up once we get the money through the bond okay um, i did want to touch on another key public safety issue um this is kind of future there are things that are coming up next or have come up um and, uh, I have horrible handwriting, so <laughs> excuse me, but uh, it says uh, GORA and body cameras. So by GORA, I'm talking about the gun offender registry. Um, it's something that my predecessor, uh, Councilman Bob Williams, um, is something we work, we've we been working on for years. Back when I was in the law department, I worked with him when he was councilman um, and working with uh, organizations such as the Gabby Giffords Gun um, Center and working with national experts to find a way that we can really seriously address the gun violence. So what a gun offender registry does, a lot of big cities have it. Um, Baltimore, New York City, which is one of the safest cities in the nation has it. Um, a lot of uh, cities out west have it. Um, and the gun offender registry simply is a way of tracking uh, repeat gun offenders a little bit better. And um, it was introduced in council finally after a lot of years of back and forth, supported by um, Chief Tracy and then it didn't meet a lot of resistance um, at city council level just because of the idea of us actually getting tough on crime was something that was frowned upon. Um, and what I wanted to you know, talk to 
and we are going to be doing more of this community conversation in the city is that um, we have to seriously give resources and focus on um, those people who simply don't get it. Um, because there are a lot of repeat gun offenders who um, it's not their first time with the gun offense, it's their second, third, fourth time. And so we need a measure of a way to track them better. And so a gun offender registry is, sim is, is similar to a sex offender registry where it just gives the police another tool in which they can track them better. So if they move, they have to notify the, the city within 10 days. Um, you know, and if they want to move out of state, there's a whole process. And it's just a way that we can better account for those folks who are engaging in gun violence. And um, that's again, it goes holistically working with the CDC is that we have to have a new approach to this uh, gun violence epidemic. So not only do we need the prevention, intervention activities, we do need, for those who do offend, we do, there has to be some measure of accountability. And I know it's a hard part to talk about um, as vice chair of the Public Safety Committee, um, as someone who's worked on uh, criminal justice both locally and nationally. It's a hard topic when you talk about um, holding people accountable. But this is a small, very small percentage, less than one, you know, a, a tenth of one percent of our population that's a serious gun offenders in the city. Um, and they have to be addressed and held accountable. So, um, you know, I will be following in um, my predecessor's footsteps in reintroducing uh, a, a revamped GORA. I think it's good for the city and something that we can work towards. Because if you look at cities that have success with gun violence, Oakland, California, New York City, what they did is they had smart policies to put services in, but they did have laws that changed. You know, New York City is one of the strictest uh, uh, cities in the world for gun, you know, having an unauthorized gun. If you have a gun in New York City, you can be facing years in prison if you, if you don't have that firearm legal. So, does New, York, does New York have body cameras? New York does have body cameras too. And so body cameras is something that um, we also talk about. Uh, body cameras is something that the city now is working on to find the funding um, because it is very expensive program uh, as uh, council president can talk about, but it goes hand in hand. You know, you can't really do the GORA without the body cam. I think you can't do the body cams without the GORA. I think you do both, they will work successfully in attacking this ep epidemic. And these are smart crime strategies that's not just stuff that we cooked up. This is stuff that other cities have. Um, council president has worked with National League of Cities. This, this is something cities all over are doing, and we're left behind in Wilmington, and we're working to get this legislation through. And I think most of us on council do believe that um, gun body cameras is an is a, a important tool to, to give to our police department. Um, but we also have to be smarter how we go about doing it. We keep using the word smart. Um, we have evidence that you know in some instances body, body cameras have worked. Um, but the, the cost of it, we looked at Newcastle County, they have body cameras totally. But they, they um, got their body, cam body cameras through a grant. Um, we applied for a grant, we did not make the grant, but we can apply for the grant again in May. But there's a push on council to want to go into our, our reserves and to get body cameras at a amount of, I think, it's, is it $800,000? No. Almost a million dollars, wow. unbudgeted. Um, to, if we do that immediately, it also requires us to do four more police officers. And the most expensive part is, of course, is the data retention. Right. Okay, that's where the cost comes in. So the state decided not to do it for their police department because of the cost. Newcastle County did it, but they did it through a grant. And I'm hoping that we also be frugal in our, you know, in our um, thinking about being smart to provide this resource to our police officers that we wait because we don't have a major issue. You know, we said we have issues, but we don't have a major issue that warrant us to go into a deficit or go into our, um, to go into, well, no deficit, excuse me, to go into our reserves that could affect our bond rating. And um, right. it, all we have to do is just wait until May when we comply for the grant. Yes. And then if it doesn't, we can make sure we put it in the budget <coughs> and we can do it smartly. So that's a little, that's what, we were, that's what we're trying to work at on council of how do we go about doing the body cameras. The whole force. Do we do the whole force, which means our police officers who are, who are, who are sitting at a desk and doing desk work, which is, is important, or do we just do our patrol, 160 patrol officers? These are decisions that we at council have to make, and we have to do it with the idea of how we're going to pay for it, okay, where that money's going to come from. But if we wait until May of 2020 and apply for the grant, then hopefully, like Newcastle County, got all the money they need that cover their, their program for five years. Yeah. And, and that's... So we need, we need to hear your voice. Let us know what you think we should do because 
it's a it's a hard decision for us to make. And I wanted to pitch it to you all. I mean, you know, what uh, you know, we have a lot of key areas out there of public safety because we do have some other issues we want to address in the next half an hour. But um, you know, are there something that we're not putting on the table? Because um, we know a lot, you know, but we don't know half of what we should know, you know. And so, you know, uh, if there's some cutting edge public safety tool that we are not thinking about, because that's what I'm about is taking your ideas and doing the research and making sure we can implement them. Because I, you know, body cameras, gun offender registries, those are some hot topics in which I've studied. But um, there's maybe some other things. So there are some things that we have. Yes, sir. Thank you. My concern is I live on a third and gray, and the, the police ride by. Sometimes if they can just stop and engage the community, it helps it will help tremendously. I mean, people, yeah, people just, that would be nice. But, I, you know, and on my side, raking the leaves and so forth, and before I can they're, say anything, I'm sorry? They're afraid. I hope they're not afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> but my, the source of my concern, they, they won't stop. And they can just stop and walk around. If you can walk around down 6th and Madison, why can't you walk around 3rd and Gray? And just have a conversation. Because that's how you engage the community. <clears throat> one. And then if I have something to say about a drug dealer that we have in our community. Exactly. Right. How can we say it? That's you got valuable to right information. That you you that's valuable information that you would be giving the, the officers. But why, you know, why they're too afraid to walk around it is blows me away. I don't, think, be that's afraid. Just, I don't think they're afraid. Well, oh, yes, well, they let me, well, they're lazy. Well, well oh, I, I, God, I would say, not. I, I would say that I, I, we, I, the, police, the police department has heard that several times. And, and they would contend that, you know, Chief Tracy's um, theory is definitely make everybody community police and get out of the cars. We would continue to relay that to the police officers that we like to get out of the cars even more. And as to what it takes to be an officer, what their daily responsibilities are, I can't speak to. But we would definitely take your point back to them and I quite make note of, yeah. of the importance. And he's right here to take note of it. Mm -hmm. he, he hears you loud and clear. I can this is what it, and, and Please do. Yeah, he can. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and would you like to go briefly, officer? Uh, just yeah. I'll introduce myself. Um, yeah. I'm Dennis Lay, um, Sergeant for the West Side. The West Side wait, Secretary, wait, wait, wait. which is uh, everything west of 95, south of the brain line. Uh, it's my responsibility to be I mean, Right now, the tenant's off, so I'm kind of watching over the whole city. But that's, that's part of my daily responsibility as a West Side Secretary. The third grade, we can definitely uh, address that. In and, and, and th th thank you very much, Sergeant. And just to talk about one dynamic of, of, of policing, um, and you'll hear Chief Tracy talk about it. I, I've talked about it a lot. Um, it is a mentality of policing that unfortunately just takes time. Um, there's two types of policing. If you look at um, the top studies on policing, there's a guardian mentality and there's a warrior mentality. <laughs> well, un unfortunately, you know, we still have a lot of police officers that have the warrior mentality. Their job is to make arrests. Their job are to um, go into community and, 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 and get numbers. We know that's not all the police, that's not even the majority, but there's still a good amount of those officers left. Mm -hmm. Now the guardian um, officer, that dynamic, that officer is there to serve the community. They're there to integrate and work with the community almost as social workers. So it's two you know, starkly different types of officers. And you know, as we get more Sergeant Leahy's and others, um, you know, Captain Campos, it, it just takes time. It's not overnight. Because there still are some that just, you know, that's, yeah. that's just the way they work, as, as Sergeant could talk about. So I think it's just really us getting a new academy class, additional training, and eventually the ones who don't get it eventually will retire or leave the department. I think that's the only way you can really change it. You can't, no matter what the chief says, yeah. it's, and the supervisors <coughs> try to hold them accountable, it's still a mentality of how they engage the citizens. And that just takes time. Well, you know, you know what? When it comes to mentality, if they're not doing their job properly, why are they still on the job? It doesn't make sense to me. Well, and, and I, I think I my the frustrations, it is, as we know, they are, um, there's a union, there's certain guidelines, they have due process rights, you can't just 
terminate a you know a, a police officer. Just okay. Cultural competency, also, and mm -hmm. cultural sensitivity. That's, mm -hmm. that's huge, mm -hmm. and, and um, not just for when I say cultural, I don't mean just for um, brown and black um, citizens. I'm also I'm also talking about our citizens that are homeless, our citizens that have mental health issues. There's a there's a whole issue around cultural competency and cultural sensitivity, and I'll leave it at at that. That's some of the training that is necessary, regardless of their mentality. It's needed. And, and I'd like to also indicate that I know that um, Chief Tracy's on the WCC also, and we hit their their police department has gone through the um, trauma informed care training as well. So we're, we're giving them, trying to give them all the tools that they need to deal with all of the different issues that we have that's plaguing our community. Um, it's, it's, you know, really sometimes we say it's not working, but it's very minute. We, it's very difficult to change this whole dynamic instantly, instantly, but you never see the needle moving until the needle has jumped. But the needle definitely is, things are happening, things are changing, and it's not just the police art department. It's the community also, their mentality also has to change. We all have, it's, that's why I said that it's not just us suffering from the trauma. I mean, the kids, it's, it's all of us, you know. And so once we understand what we're experiencing and what, what our issues are and, and accept it um, and say, okay, I'm going to make this change and we're going to do this together regardless, um, then I think we see the needle move a little faster. And there's another lens to that because a lot of it, uh, we, it's generational. we talk about police, but then we don't talk about police services. Um, and then additional mental health services and support services for officers and their families. Um, for me, I grew up in a law enforcement household, so I know the other side of it. And it is, um, they are put into these almost, you know, uh, the, these very dire circumstances, um, neighborhoods that are um, destroyed a lot of times, and they're asked to perform the job role of social worker and educator. So we have to look at how can we support our officers in, in terms of making sure they have what they need so they can perform the best. So it's a, so a two-way street that's looking at the problem. It's not only helping resource and them interact with the community, but how can we help the officers perform better so they can then interact with the community in a proper way. Hi, I have two, two comments. Um, the first is, I think in any profession, you have people who are not doing their job well. But I have to say I'm really what their job entails. I'm a graduate of Citizens Police Academy, and I think they really do a good job um, with what they're up against, especially in other cities um, in the world, <laughs> in, uh, in the country. So uh, I think we need to give them uh, maybe a little bit more support for what they do and recognize that there's people everywhere that don't do their job well, not just some policemen. The other comment uh, to your statement is I think it's great if policemen stop in neighborhoods, especially if they interact with the kids. You know, you see policemen just take a second, hit a ball back and forth, and for them to see police as mentors or have some positive influence or they're not bad guys, it, it might make them gravitate towards not committing crime to say, hey, these are really pretty good people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. I think the lady, the lady behind it um, on, on that topic, I just wanted to add that I very much miss the community policing officers. Um, you know, for, we, we had very strong relationships with the community policing officers, and I think that was extremely beneficial. Maybe allowing the, the foot patrol officers to do their job, but, the, but we had people that we interacted with all the time, and I don't know if there's any possibility of bringing that back, but it's sorely missed. Well, I think it's, am I correct, officer, that everyone is part of the community police initiative? Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. Yeah, that's what they say. But when the it former mayor, the former mayor and the former police chief dismantled the CPU, mm -hmm. and it really did make a difference in the communities. I built relationship with these police officers that they're not even there anymore, and I still talk to these guys. Okay. And it's 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 very easy to say the whole force is a community force, but it's not when you're used to having one officer per district that interacts with all the civic associations, you have a cell phone number, 
you know, he checks in with you. It's, it's a whole different dynamic. And, and I know it's beating a dead horse because I don't think we're ever getting them back, but we really do need them. I, I wouldn't say never say never. I, I would say is that's, that's, that's why we're here. Because I, it's something I have, um, hearing about citizen transition is something that I can discuss with Chief Tracy and, and Council President. We can discuss this because, you know, our job is to service all of you. And so um, if these issues, we like a lot what they're doing, but if this is a community policing, this is an issue that we still need, then we can address that with Chief Tracy. Definitely will. Definitely. Oh, this is to the, the woman over there that um, praised the Wilmington Police Department. You may have had good experiences with them, and for whatever reason, you know, they treated you better than they treat me. Um, you know, it, it, we all have different experiences with them. So, um, you may think they're wonderful, but I, I just, as a whole, I don't think they are. And, and, and so let's, let's touch on, because um, we are running short on time, we'll touch on another big part of this equation economic development and housing um, it's something that can't be overlooked because a lot of these issues that we talk about public safety CDC opioid uh, new opioid tactics LED lights ATV uh, body cameras group violence intervention you'll hear a lot of stuff well that takes economic development <laughs> and that takes money and it takes uh, a, a stabilized city uh, a tax base businesses thriving it takes all that jobs so this is the part of the equation that we're going to talk about. Um, so we do have one uh, recent uh, big, big victory. Um, we had the approval, the Bancroft um, um, Bar Barley Mill project, the Wagons project. Um, so a lot of you were instrumental in getting that passed. We just had that passed by county council last week. Um, that is going to be, uh, have a large effect on our area as it's just a half a mile uh, outside of uh, the city limits. And it will, um, you know, it's you know, estimated it will bring um, at least a thousand jobs, not only just um, the direct service jobs, but also construction jobs. Um, and, you know, our job is uh, from the city council perspective to make sure those jobs go to city residents, of course. Um, community benefits agreements are important to both uh, me and Hanifa, and it is making sure that that project really helps our district. Um, and with that, there are going to be some traffic issues that we're going to have to address. Um, that's going to be um, us working with Public Works and Delgott to make sure that residents can still get to and from their homes, given there's some additional traffic. So all that will need to occur within the next few years. I believe the project is slated to finish in 2022. So I'd uh, love for you all to work with us to uh, finish this, uh, to help this project go along. So we're able to see a successful project that benefits our residents, not just benefits the developers, but benefits our people. Um, does anybody have any comments about the Barley Mill project? Or? Is that part of the agreement, though? Is it they're going to hire local? Is that, I mean, is that, is that just a proposal, or is that like, that's a I think it's something that they said they would do. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And also, based on how far they're along and what other kinds of legalities they might need, I really encourage and I, work, I will work strong with um, Councilman Johnson to work with the community on a community benefits agreement. Um, in my 12 years in council, I've done the only six done in the state. Um, with early, all the development that happened in the 4th District, the unit could not build in the 4th District unless there was a community development, a community benefits agreement. <laughs> that's the way district. they do it in other cities. And yeah. that's and something so, we have to get back to. And so we really have to understand that tool that we use, and that's really getting the community engaged and, and having the community, the community um, uh, organize and plan what do you want. If you have a big developer coming in your district, and what do we want that developer and their project to do for the community and how does it benefit? So, you know, I'm very proud to say that those six that I've done have resulted in employment and, and the use of local businesses being engaged in that, in that, um, in that, in that project. You know, so um, I'll work along with Councilman Johnson to see if a community benefits agreement is warranted in this project and any other project. Because any time that you get a letter in the mail that someone needs a variance of some type, they say, you know, they, you get letters in the mail, they say they, this person's applying for a variance, you got power in that. So we're saying the community, we, that the community says, well, we support your project and we're, uh, we will approve your variance, but this is what we also need done in our community. If you're going to come and cause extra traffic, you know, whatever you're going to, the issues you might cause, 
what is going to, how is it going to benefit the community, such a community benefits agreement. So I would encourage everyone to understand the power that you have in uh, just not saying okay to the zoning board because you can use that, and I've done it six times in my district. That's awesome, I never knew that. And, and it's something that, uh, and again, this is why. I, they tell me I don't tell what I do, I just do it. I <laughs> no, don't, I really don't. It's I don't. very important, and that's the old I school just do approach. It. I just do it. That's how um, old school legislators that I learned yeah, um, through it, it and uh, you know, that's, that's how it's done, is, is there's a give and take. Um, and I'm not anti-development, we're not anti-development, we need development in the city, but it's gotta benefit our people. But I, I just want to give one little shout out. The, the author of the Community Benefit Agreement legislation is Professor Rahima Jabbar Bay. And the neighborhood assistant. You can do it. Let me tell you, we, it's a tried and true method. Yes. <laughs> because there's a, there's a question here. My question is with the, the, the money coming in from various businesses that are coming into these communities, how would these. Um, um, how are they going to employ people to come in? Are they going to be outsourced? Are they going to be in the neighborhood? Are they going to be people in our, in our um, district? You know, because it's all well and good for these jobs to come in, but you want to rally up the morale of a community, you employ your community. So that's my question. Well, that's what I was saying the Community Benefits Agreement does. It it's writes in the agreement, uh, and this agreement is a sole agreement between the community not the government, the community and the developer. Okay. And then in that agreement, there is written agreement of what that, could do, that um, project will do, or that developer will do, in order for a, to be an agreement of the community to approve their zoning needs. So if you say that you want a certain number of percentage of employment being done coming from the community, you put that in agreement. If you ask that we want your cameras to turn towards our neighborhoods, we want you to landscape this, this other park, Whatever it is that you think is better to benefit your community in order to have this new business come into and invade your neighborhood, then you ask. And in this agreement that you have in writing, and then it states that we support your agreement based on the, that we approve your agreement based on, we, excuse me, we approve your variance request based on the community benefits agreement. Failure to do so makes them somewhat out of compliance yeah. of their zoning barracks. And, and just to kind of piggyback off that, so we looked at not only Barley Mill at the West End of uh, Lancaster, but then we have the uh, $40 million Galleria project at the other edge of the um, district. And that's also potential for um, a project that can have great impact on our community. Um, that's gonna be uh, not only it's gonna be uh, residential space, it's gonna be commercial space as well. Um, it's going to be a lot that we um, could benefit potentially from that project, but it's important that we work with, uh, with the government officials and also the planning council to work and make sure we get what we need in that project, as well as the flats, the ongoing flats project as well. Those are the three major projects in our district. I think he has a question. Okay. Um, you know, you kind of rushed us along. Now, I don't know about your methods. And I know Bob gave us a chance to speak. This lady has something else to say, and I certainly have something else to say. I don't want to be rushed past the issue of police. Oh, okay. Now, you know, I, I know we have a lot of things on the agenda, but one of the things that's important with us is community policing. And as I mentioned about taking the time to talk to us, well, this lady had a, uh, had a good point because I've had nothing but problems with police. Now, I must say, I must say, Chief Tracy has made uh, leaps and bounds as far as improvements. I can give him that. Uh, I'm not sure about the issue of crime, but I've had nothing but problems with police. Yeah. Nothing but problems, even from the 60s. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't like them, they didn't like me. And that's okay. But I'm saying, now we have a chance to improve relationships, and I would advise you, please don't just hush us along. Yeah, I, I appreciate the feedback. Again, I was just trying to stay on our agenda, but we are not, this is, Public safety is number one, and, and so, you know, um, this is something, dialogue we're gonna continue to have, these community policing issues. I appreciate that. Um, this is something that I work hard as vice chair of the Public Safety Committee to make sure we're doing what we need to do um, to make sure that our citizens are safe. It seems like you were having a, a monologue. All right. so. I think the gentleman here had a comment. <clears throat> <clears throat> I 
In regard to your uh, community development agreements, uh, I'm curious how they are manifested because we as a community have reached out to certain organizations and there's been verbal agreements, commitments on their part, but they totally ignore it after a couple months. So these community development things, how would a community go about initiating one of them? Would it have to be through uh, an elected official like yourself? So who's going to pay the attorney fee, uh, fees to make it a binding agreement on the uh, developer then? Well, we were we were blessed. Look, I don't, Professor Joe Barbara, would you like to speak to this <laughs> on, on the different? Because if they've done, we've done different ones, different ways. So, but she is the expert on it. There are actually. Could you get the microphone? Oh, sorry. The reason why I said you can do it. Many of the agreements that have been made in our city and different neighborhoods and in the state pro bono attorneys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Why? Because there are social justice attorneys who are just, yes, let's make this happen <laughs> for you and on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And so that question of paying for it, don't even worry about it. Mm -hmm. The first one that we did in Southbridge, I'm going to say this, a Widener attorney of law, who's also a professor, he was the pro bono attorney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of the work that I was doing at UD, long time, I, I retired three years ago, 30 years, okay. <laughs> I know the attorney who actually started the community benefit agreement in the country. His wife is from Delaware. <laughs> He's like, Raymond, want me to come back? Yes. <laughs> so I'm saying this, and I didn't even say my first statement, you're organized. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important what he said about your civics and your NPC. And I'm going to say this. If you think that they've come in, uh, not that interested anymore, they need new blood, make it happen. Mm -hmm. Because that, your businesses, because there have to be incorporated groups, as well as nonprofits, and as well as your civics, they all have to come together. Not everybody, just two or three people from each one of them and they become your community benefit agreement coalition. I mean, I am so ready to help you do it. Do you hear me? Because you can do it. Any developer, nonprofit, for-profit, housing, business, commercial, they're going to do something in your neighborhood that will impact your quality of life, then you need to benefit from it. That's all I can say right now. But don't worry about that. Who's the attorney? I already know someone who will help. And, and that's and that's what we're we're here. If if you notice what we talk about tonight is one thing. I we want to hit on this. If I say one thing, but it, we're, we're talking about solutions um, tonight. You know, you'll hear me when I talk on council. I talk very little about the problem. We all know what the problems are. Um, all of us are educated in our life experience and knowing what the problems are. But it's us brainstorming and working together to find solutions. That's why, again, revamp civic associations, NPCs, community groups, that's going to help make these changes because uh, CBAs, community benefits agreements, that's one key to it. So um, definitely in our district, it's key because we have such a commercial corridor. Um, so you know, what I want is some other ideas. Does anybody have anything else you've seen or heard a way we can re revitalize our area um, out there? I know there's a lot going on. but. Does anybody have any projects you're interested in? Questions about it? No, we're working on starting some projects, but not for a while. Okay. Um, so one thing that sort of fits in the lens of revitalization is uh, Brandywine. Um, so um, you've all you might have heard me talk about this issue um, and how they counseling center fits into what we're doing in our district. Um, we are working very hard and being partners with Brandywine. Um, I know a lot of you are involved on the ground level and making sure that they're, we're a community partner so that they're able to um, flourish and service their constituents, but also that um, the community standards of our community are upheld. So um, as you all have talked, again, I'm not gonna belabor it tonight, but um, there is gonna be a plan in place 
um, very soon uh, for us to um, really work with them to make sure our community standards are upheld. In fact, uh, uh, Council President and I uh, meet the mayor soon on this issue. We've met with state legislators. Um, we're working with their lobbyists. We're doing whatever we can. A lot of, um, um, a lot of just meetings to make sure that we can get a plan in place that works and can uphold our community. Because I know that's a major issue in our district. Mm -hmm. And so hearing your voice, we, so we can take what your voice concerns are to these meetings <coughs> and come up with a solution to address that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've been working with Chris on this. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Brandywine Council. Brandywine Council. <coughs> I thought it was a request. <laughs> 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 well, I'm not a great writer. Right. 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 I was not a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> but, and then one other, um, and, and, and the council president can talk about the land bank and the homestead program. Those are other key revitalization efforts that we need to uh, work with in the city. Right, and one of the things before I go into those particular points, I just want to say another piece of legislation that um, I was able to put through was a senior identification program. You know, our there are seniors who we just don't know sometime where they are, you know, and so we wanted to make sure that we knew where our seniors are, um, especially if you're, they're still in the home or their, or their, their, their own home. Um, with the senior identification program, um, we'll be able to know where they are so that we can ensure that if L and I go, they go out for citations um, and they have applied for um, the senior exempt program. I don't know if you know about that, if you're over 65, you can apply for the senior exempt program where if you have a certain income, you are exempt from your property taxes and a discount on your sewer and water. And so we want to make sure that if L and I are going through inspections and they see it's a senior home and know that the senior might be on a low income um, or a, um, a fixed income, um, we do have programs through the real estate and housing where we could get them assistance to fix up their houses and they will continue to get the citations and the fines mm -hmm. for being out of compliance. So what we have to take care of our seniors, I mean, they've made the way for us, and I felt this was a way to make sure that that special pro that, uh, population is well taken care of. And in it, we also were looking at uh, trying to identify senior ambassadors, because I know that sometimes when you try to tell, talk to seniors about their personal and financial situation, they don't like to tell you. My mother's 92, and she says she can handle it on her own. I'm still paying on my bills. I'm doing this. <laughs> but we don't know. She doesn't know. <laughs> Some of the new modern things and, and opportunities is out there for her, and just trying to get her to ease up a little bit on it, you know, um, so that we can help her. Having that ambassador that she trusts, right now that's my brother, um, that you can, she trusts. But there's other seniors who don't have the family around. Who can help them to make sure that they get in all the rewards and all the exemptions that they deserve. So we're, ex we're excited about that project coming into fruition. Um, he mentioned the land bank. Um, I know you might have heard about the Wilmington Neighborhood Conservancy Land Bank. Um, it's just kicked off his office on the, on 3rd and 4th and 5th of Market Street. And um, the land bank is a nonprofit uh, 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 organization that um, is a deposit for uh, vacant properties. And so the vacant properties right now are there. Um, and so how do we get these vacant properties back online? We've partnered with a community neighborhood organization that keeps them boarded up that keeps the vacant lots that are on part of the, this listing to keep those lots clean. You start seeing some of the lots with uh, wooden fences around them. That's an effort of us trying to make sure that we, the properties that are in the land bank are not part of the blight situation. So we established a homestead program, and the homestead program has identified what, pro what houses are not that bad in condition. Some of them are in horrible condition, um, but that takes the least amount of money to renovate them. And we have had three sessions now um, with um, potential home buyers to come to here understand how they could take advantage of getting one of those vacant properties. Former Dan Mayor Dan Frawley was the first homesteader in the nation. And that was the beginning of what is now known as Trolley, Trinity Vicinity. And so how do we make Trinity Vicinities all throughout our neighborhoods? If some of the vacant properties are in neighborhoods where most of us grew up in, but we got, grew up and we moved out, but those are childhood neighborhoods. So who best to go back and put life back into that neighborhood but maybe our children that was once, you know, had, did they have that kind of great fun that you had on a certain side of town. So we're, through the Homestead Program, if you qualify, you can get that property for $1. And we're working $1 for the price of the property. But you have to demonstrate that you can get the renovation costs. Right. And we do take, you know, <coughs> um, sweat equity into consideration. You know, but if you can demonstrate that you can turn that property around and bring it back online, we're going to build our neighborhoods one step at a time. 
So I'm very excited about this homestead program. It's still, we've had our third session. Our next session is December 12th at the Community Education Building at 10 a.m. So you can come out and learn how, can, how you can possibly get one of those properties. And we're working on other programs. Homestead program is just one just disposition type of program that we're working on. We're also looking at local investors. You know, that if you're gonna turn the house over and put in um, family or friend in that house. You know, a father might want to put the child into a house and so they buy the house renovated and move the child in. Okay, and the whole thing with revitalize the neighborhood is that it's important that we use local individuals. I'm very excited that we not only thought about well, who's going to do the construction work. So we did a call out to all local construction companies, big and small, to come out. We had about 125 small contractors to come and say, what could we do to make you sure that you are able to get some of these contracts? So it's our community building our communities. And partnering with some of the workforce development training programs through our local 55 construction companies and I mean uh, labor uh, unions and just other other workforce development programs, so our small contractors don't have the the workforce capacity. We can hire from those workforce development training programs. So now we turn it over our communities and everybody and all of the reinvestment in our neighborhoods is staying in our neighborhoods. We don't have local people outside the neighborhoods coming to see Wilmington, revitalizing Wilmington. It's us doing it one house at a time. So I'm very excited about the Homestead Program and at that time Christian worked, you know how hard I've been trying to get this idea up off the ground and the fact that it's now gone, we have six individuals already who have completed their, their, um, their applications and have home and working on revitalizing the homes. So six out of like 2,000 is a, wow. <laughs> it's a start, <laughs> but it's a start, baby. It's a start and we started this about three months ago. So I'm very excited about that initiative and glad that the board of the um, land bank heard me because I was very loud and determined that we was gonna do this homestead program. We couldn't be the Wilmington Neighborhood Conservancy Land Bank and not be building our neighborhoods up by the neighborhood. So, um, I didn't know that they had started the homestead program up. Is there any literature online about it that I can get asked? Brand right. new, right? WilmingtonLandBank.com. So yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is. We have some right here. Oh, we got information okay. there for you. Yeah. So we've, it's, this is our third session that we had inviting people in. Um, but it's, it's got all the information is on is on the website. And there's a there's a Channel 22 had a focus did an in focus program. Um, on um, on our channel 22, y'all got to look at channel 22. That's where you learn all that's going on because it is the award-winning nationwide Pulse of the City TV yeah. station. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I watch you on TV when you're in town. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's what I'm about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when we're not in session, there's other important. Yes, channel 22 is still showing that there's a Little Italy Neighborhood Association that meets every uh, first Monday of every month, and yet we haven't met updated. in years. We'll have that so updated it's, immediately. It's oh, it's gonna be great. a new revitalized civic association, right? All right. What's that? It's gonna be a new civic association, so you guys are gonna be meeting what? again soon. Yeah. And, uh, but it, and it's still showing Bob instead of you. Exactly. Our councilman. Okay. Yeah, so we just need to update. I, I don't, I, yeah, I thought it was the eight to Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so I, I just want to talk about another important program um, that and Tish can talk about what time we're running to. But, yeah. Oh, the facade okay. programs? Okay, facade. but the facade program and the home repair loan program, Council President can talk about that. But the home repair loan program is a program that I believe, and this is what I'm going to work on, is making sure it's advertised more. There's a lot of dollars that still aren't spent in the city on these home repair loans. Right, and then, and then, then we need to put more in an upcoming budget, we need to put more money into mm -hmm. it. So for us to try to do the revitalization of neighborhoods that need to be done, we need to put that in. Because if we're putting, if we're building um, homestead homes and we're bringing them back online um, and um, that nonprofits have properties as well and they're building them up, the homeowners that are already there, they need, we need to give them some love as well too. So through the facade program, you know, if all of us are working together, that we can turn a block around, you know, by um, everybody mm -hmm. taking advantage of such, of such activities. So right now it has about $500,000 funding? No, no the, the $500,000 oh. um, is from this, was, it was two things of um, five, two um, batches of $500,000. The first one was we've got it through the CDB dollars, and that's helping the homeowners who get the vacant properties that through the CDB regulations, if they meet 
um, based on their income, we could give them a $20,000 um, forgivable grant to help them do all the major infrastructure you know, the air conditioning, heating, to make sure that's stable part, and they have the rest of the dollars to do the rest of the uh, renovations as necessary. But there was um, a budget amendment that we proposed, that the administration proposed for an additional $500,000 so that we could give another 25 properties the $2,000 to $20,000 grant without all the restrictions the CDBG has, but it didn't pass council, so we can only do 25. So, um, I'm just, I mean, we've been trying to do things that would be able to revitalize our neighborhood, but just getting it through and getting it done is what we just, just our just little effort that we have to do for in council. And, and we'll talk about one key item. Um, there's blight legislation, um, vacant property. You talk about that one. <laughs> vacant, <laughs> property, <laughs> vac vacant property legislation. <laughs> Um, as, as we talked about with the home repair loans, um, unfortunately in council we hit log jams um, on, on trying to find these problems to uh, to fix these uh, these areas in our community that are highly distressed. So you know what we find with the blight program is legislation you all may have heard about, but it applies to rental properties. It was originally proposed to apply to. Um, homeowners, um, the section and offset only applies to vacant properties. Essentially, it is um, as written as a way to keep the renters honest and to make sure that there's more L and I enforcement mechanisms. You mean the landlords honest? Yeah, like landlords, okay. landlords yeah. honest. Landlords. Make sure there's more enforcement. Um, it changes part. It changes it from a uh, criminal uh, code to a civil offense, so that the city can move faster. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion over the past, I think, two years on ways we can make this better. Um, we've engaged with community groups. Since I've been on council, I've worked with community groups. Um, I think we have a, a version that uh, can hopefully, um, a reworked version that can hopefully stand the test of time and uh, have the support from everyone. Because it is very important that we hold these landlords accountable. Um, a lot of them are slumlords. A lot of them are um, preying on our communities. And not, um, I know I've heard a lot of personal accounts from folks who live near rental properties. Uh, I know Rita, you could probably to attest mm -hmm. to the damage uh, a bad rental has caused on your livelihood. Sure. And so it's very important to me, and I've heard a lot from the district, and I know all of you are supportive in some mechanism in making sure that we hold um, landlords accountable. Because um, we want them to be good landlords. We want them to participate in all the city programs but we can't have them prey on our, our, our weakest. So this is a focus, I think, of this council in getting something that works. I think the latest amendments uh, folks will like. Um, there's, there's offsetting provisions. Um, there's a way to revamp L&I Review Board. There's also a way that um, some of the funds will go um, towards uh, tenant relocation um, because that's an issue that there's going to be homes that are going to be shut down where we're going to put those tenants. And then lastly, last but not least, there's going to be a sunset provision in which we say, look, um, we're going to try this program almost as a pilot program. We're going to try it for a few years. If it doesn't work, we're going to go back to the drawing table, and council's going to work on finding something that works. But um, this is something that I know has been hotly debated, but it really is something that needs to be done. Whatever form it is, it's something that needs to be done, because right now we have 10,000-plus uh, vacants. We have a lot of uh, tenant-occupied units that are not really where people shouldn't be living. Um, so there's a lot of issues with trash, sewage, a lot of issues that are serious quality of life issues. And we have a way of addressing. So what I need is the community support and input on ways we can work to make this legislation. Because even when it passes, it's not going to be the best it can be. It's never going to be the best it can be. How could we make sure it's whatever we need for the community? So does anybody have any feedback right now on that program? But I just, I just want to say, too, that in reference to the right legislation, it's a huge, multi-dimensional issue that's been that's been um, plaguing our community for a long, long time. Some of these properties have been vacant for decades. So to think that we're going to come up with something, one directive action to address it, it's nowhere. So we're going to have to take a bit piece at a time. Okay, it's just agreeing on what that piece is first and then work it together to address. And, and that is the key. This, it, this is not a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. So, we, but we got to try something because we have a situation with the blight and the amount of rental properties that we have in our community. I think almost a good, 
Um, in some neighborhoods, there's almost a 50%, uh, if not more, percentage of properties that are rental. Um, and, and then coupled with the vacant, the homeowner's values go down. So how do we build up the values of our community so that we can build wealth? We know the home ownership builds wealth. So how do we do this in our low income neighborhoods um, by taking some properties? Because that was the issue with the need of that $50,000 budget amendment, I mean $500,000 budget amendment. Because we have properties in the neighborhoods that we love and that we grew up in. And so that property needs eighty-five dollars to $90,000 worth of renovation, but the property appraisals in that neighborhood is only 65000 mm -hmm. Somebody has to give a subsidy somewhere. And that was a, that's why I was very adamant, very supportive of that piece of legislation that we could have gave 25 homeowners $20,000. That's a big piece. You know, a, a big piece, yeah. and now we can't because it didn't, it didn't pass. But it's not dead. I hope we can bring it back Beautiful. up again. Um, but we're two years behind, and so how do we get that going? And so um, I have good confidence in us that we're going to come up with a solution to life. You know, even if it's a one step at a time, we're going to come to a solution to it. So my name is Christian Willauer, and I've been um, very involved in housing issues in Wilmington. And I think that there are some real solutions out there. I think that nobody would disagree that um, rental properties that aren't taken care of are a problem and that vacant properties are a problem. But I think the real question that we have to face as a community is what's the right policy to address that? It's not that anybody disagrees with the, the problem, but the solution. So the proposed blight bill, I just think it's really important. It sounds kind of great, um, you know, like going from criminal to civil. But really what that means for rental properties <coughs> is, is that for any, I just, you know, just to make clear, if you haven't read the legislation, for any rental property where that has any code violation, whether that's like peeling paint or something super big, like no heat, that rental property, if, if it doesn't repair that code violation in 30 days, that rental property can get a fine of $250 a week, every week until the code violation is fixed. Like that's what going, in the case of this bill, that's what going from criminal to civil means. And I think there are other municipalities that have administrative code enforcement that look different from what's proposed in Wilmington that are more effective but we shouldn't pass a bill that could be more, that, I mean, if you can just imagine all the home repairs that you have in your house that you don't get repaired in 30 days. And the, the proposal to the council that many people have made is, is reserve those kind of penalties for like major health and safety code violations, not like any code violation, but major health and safety code violations. And the same thing for rent for vacant properties. The concept for vacant properties is, is right now if you own a vacant property, every on an annual basis there are fines. And what this legislation does is it, it kind of doubles those fines. But we've had rental uh, vacant property fines for over 10 years. And when we started the program, we had 1,400 vacant properties. Now we have 1,800 vacant properties. I just feel like there has to be solutions around vacant properties. They're not just about, you know, fines. It's almost like you double down on a, on a program that doesn't necessarily work. So my question to you is, is, there's been a couple of amendments that have been proposed by the community. One is to reserve the major health, the, the, the aggressive fines for major health and safety code violations just so that that's focused on like really bad landlords. And the second is, is when a property is vacant, it gets fined not just because nobody's there, but because the vacant property has code violations, right? It's not just unoccupied, but it has code violations. And then I know something else that people have said is, is how can we make sure that every owner, whether that's the city or a nonprofit, is held to a standard that every vacant property, no matter who the owner, that vacant property is kept clean, secure, and watertight. So I want to, you know, I do think that the problem is the right one to identify, but I want to ask you, like, is, is, this, new, is this proposed um, legislation, is it going to include those things that are going to make the fines apply to unoccupied properties that have code violations, not just any one? Are you going to focus the fines on, like, major health and safety code violations, not just any code violation? And are you going to hold all property owners whether that's the city of Wilmington or anybody else, accountable to a standard so that we don't have 
vacant properties in our neighborhoods that are nuisances in addition to being uh, vacant? Well, you know, that's, you asked a lot of uh, several different <laughs> questions, but okay, but I, I, all I want to say is that, you know, you said health issues. So if I'm in an apartment that I'm paying eight to $900 a month rent in, and I don't have any heat, that's a major health issue to that me. That would qualify as major. That was a major health issue. And also, I mean, we're now talking about, I mean, property, rental property is a business. Right, so we're now making provisions. You know, it seems as though some of the pushback on some of the light, light legislation is more in favor to the landlords than to the residents that live there. I think, you know, so it, it was best and needed for the residents. So I guess that's my, and we can have, you know, me and you had conversation about this before, but I just, I just want to say that some of the things that I'm hearing regarding the new position of the black legislation is benefiting the landlord and not the tenants who are living in substandard housing. You know, I know that the, when we first started this, the, um, there were, I think, about 200 some odd um, landlords who agreed to have their, their apartment um, inspected. And if you want to agree to have an inspection, you must feel confident that your apartment's going to pass. Well, almost a third of them failed. They were, some of them were not even fit for inhabitants. So those landlords are thinking that what that current condition of that apartment is, is okay, and, it, and it's not. So we have to, you know, from my perspective, the people voted me in, and I think I speak strongly for the people who are paying 800 to to $1,000 living in substandard housing. I had to help a young lady get a stove in her house. She was cooking on a hot plate. Her landlord wouldn't give her a stove. So how do we, how do we go back to those type of landlords? How do we, you know, you know, so it's, 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 it's such a huge, yeah. Elephant in a and room. I, that's what I'm saying. And I, such and a, and so we have to start with some type of standardization somewhere, so that we can ensure that our residents have a, 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 a standard, a, a good quality of life to live in. And then, if you are, if we make regulations, and if you are a good landlord, then you won't get fined because you're a good landlord well, and you and, follow the rules, and, right? And, and, so, and I think part of what I've been working on is the implementation, because that is a big piece. We want to make sure that L and I inspectors, right. the limited resource they have, are focused on those. Uh, those serious issues that we talk about. And that goes to internal regulations, I think working with Commissioner Starkey, making sure that internal regulations and implementation of l and is exactly achieves this stated goal of improving our neighborhoods. But I can tell you, and this is our focus, um, and this is what I promised Council President, is I did not come in to not do anything in Council. Um, so that is one thing I, I know we did talk about is I'm gonna be pushing for the tenants who are hurt um, for the business owners and, and the neighbors that are hurt by blight. And whatever we can do to make it happen, we're going to make it happen. And I want to make sure the resources are there so that, um, you know, we don't want low income, um, um, you know, residents of our community pushed out. That is not what we want. And it's working to make sure that folks are able to be in, you know, very livable conditions in a part of Wilmington and giving back. Because we've heard a lot of horror stories here about just residents who live in these conditions in this third world. No one should live like that. Can I, see, can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. because, you know, nationwide, the most effective thing to do to improve rental housing is to do regular inspections, right? So my concern is, is that we should be doing regular inspections in order to get compliance. We only did 127 rental inspections well, like basically, Wilmington stopped doing rental inspections. So it's kind of a free-for-all in the rental market. Then you come in with fines that really, for code violations, that could potentially put a lot of landlords out of business. And when you put the landlord out of business, the tenant no longer has a place to live. So why not prioritize rental inspections and save the major penalties for the major health and safety code violations? and change your legislation to reflect that. Like, it just, it just would make a lot more sense. But also, too, Kristen, I mean, if you get a citation, you do have a period of time to do your 30 days. Do your 30 30 days. days. So if, if, so, and we know if you just found out it's not in your, it's not in your plan of action immediately, but if you demonstrate that you are planning, that you're doing something about it, then the, the, then the, the, the fine doesn't come. But if you just don't do anything, and that's what has happened. They've gotten citations and people haven't done, have done, have not done anything. And then the citations continue to accumulate, accumulate, and nothing ever gets done. So we have to put some teeth somewhere to, you know, to get people that let them know that we are serious about it. 
And if you demonstrate, well, okay, you're right, I got this, I'm working on it, and, and you think there's a, there's a demonstration of you're trying to work on it, we're not trying to be the big bad wolf. We're not trying to, or put even give anybody that kind of power to do that, but we have to do something to get things happening. So again, that's why we're still working on it. That's why it's pen and pencil and it's an eraser and we're gonna keep working on the legislation until we get something that works. And if it, like you said, he put a sunset in it, if it doesn't work, then we come back and do it again. Yeah. You know, we come back and work on it because this is a huge, 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 huge situation. And if we don't do something, we're never going to be able to do something about our current housing stock. So even if we do just a little bit to get started, yeah. we gotta make it steps towards. So I'm gonna give this gentleman a chance to speak, sir. I don't know if I want to get in the middle of this. Uh, <laughs> two very smart women here. Uh, um, I am curious, though, since uh, it's kind of piqued my interest. Uh, you, a lot of these other programs that you've mentioned, you have, uh, and Chris, you and I have talked about this before. You know, you have data from, uh, you know, it's really obvious about what's worked in other towns, and I'm just curious. Um, I don't know a lot about this. So is the blight bill, is, is the proposals of the blight bill, are they based on things that have had uh, visible, visible effects in other towns that might be suffering from the same sort of experiences? Is that, is that clear? I mean, are we, are we making provisions in the blight bill that are backed up by data from other, other towns? Yeah, well, uh, so this is the- Some aspects of it. Yes, yeah, so, uh, certain aspects are, but then um, it is with code enforcement is very uh, individualized because it's hyper local. Um, so I say it's taking what's working in other cities, but then trying to integrate it for Delaware or Wilmington specifically. Wilmington is different to Newark, for example. So you know, again, um, that's what the L and I department has worked to do. And I've talked to them about this because my thing is, no matter what plan we have, if we can't implement it, it doesn't work. So it's about getting the inspectors on task, L and I review board on task, making sure that we can do something that works. But I, but I think what we oftentimes, I think legislators get scared of is failing. Um, and one thing is uh, sometimes you have to um, be confident in failing um, or not getting something 100% right. And that's something that um, I know is why I do what I do because um, we have to do something um, because we're failing our constituents but not doing anything. And so we need something passed that works for the community. And we need a way to make it happen to get our city out of the, um, a lot of neighborhoods which are destabilized. I mean, our district is, is, a, is a strong district, but there's a lot of districts in the um, city that are, are, are really uh, underwater. And so we need to work in revitalizing the whole city. We have one more comment here, and then I think we want to Can I just make one comment? Excuse me, ma'am. Sorry. Um, yes. This legislation is slate, slated for the November 4th Finance Committee meeting on Monday at 5 o'clock p.m. What was that? What was that? This legislation is slated for the Finance Committee meeting on Monday, November the 4th at 5 o'clock p.m. in the City County Building. This blight situation? Yes. Okay. And you can always go on our website, WilmingtonCityCouncil.com. <coughs> and find all of the legislations and our meeting dates and so you can review it for yourself and then you can you know and then we have a um email address that you can send comments to us okay. so if you can't make the meeting you have points that you would like to have included you can send those comments in to us just yes, ma'am okay um you almost and all of you who have spoken on this have really brought me to full circle as to what i'm about to say yes, um i'm a landlord in a blight situation but I know that if the inspector's coming on a regular basis, I take care of my infractions mm -hmm. so that I can pass. Right. And I do believe that if something like that was implemented, where a landlord, good or bad, knows that next month, oh, I'm up for inspection. Oh, and I'm up for inspection. If they do just the small improvements that need to be done, so that they are not penalized for that small one, all right, then it's a move in the right direction. And, and I know it's a, it's, a big, it's a big thing to handle. Really, it is. L and I is big, and they, they, they scare a lot of landlords, okay? <laughs> but you can scare a landlord with a, a landlord knowing that I got an appointment with L and I on this day, so I better do what I need to do. And it, it may work and it may not work, 
but I think it's something that could be implemented. To, to, to have those regular inspections that landlords know that L&I is coming. Right. Regular inspections Thank you. are a great idea. Thank you, Thank you for that input. Yeah. So we're, we're like five minutes to the to 8 o'clock and we don't want to hold you any close longer because you thought it was over 7.30. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, um, but th this is the, what the community conversation is all about, is for us to sit and talk about, you know, things that are um, on the minds of the community, things that you know, we council members should listen to and take into consideration as we are um, developing legislation as well as voting on legislation. So. Um, yeah, and I just want to pay back what council president said, it's something I've learned from her. Is that, I carry you on my it is. It is doing. Um, <laughs> hear a lot, uh, and, and the council has a bad reputation. Um, we're working to restore that reputation where it is focused on um, ordinances, big programs that can change and move our city forward. It's nice to do resolutions here and there. Um, that looks good for TV, but I'm not here for that. And you all know who know me. I'm not here for that. I'm here for changing um, block by block what's going on in our community. So it is working um, and getting um, a, you know, UDAC funding in our, in our district, um, development dollars, uh, helping out small businesses. That's what my priority is. It's not to be on TV. Um, you'll often see me in meetings. It, it, you know, I, I try to say very little. I, I kind of state my legal positions and that's it. Because I want to focus on the district and focus on solving the problems that we have. So uh, working with Council President, we're trying to get back to that. Solving and putting spending time looking at the data, looking at the studies, looking at the science and saying, well, how can we put legislation together that changes our city? And so that's what you'll never you know, see you know, coming from this district, and you won't see it coming from council president. You won't see junk. You won't see stuff that's not going to be um, helping bit by bit to, to move the city forward. So I appreciate you all being engaged, because that's part of our vision, is engage, bring up civic associations, help you hold us accountable. Because if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to or any other council person, the district should be holding that council person accountable. But often we don't have that, you know, because at the end of my tenure, I want to, you, you should be able to say, what piece of legislation did you get passed, Chris? What piece of legislation did you sponsor? I mean, one part we just had recently, we, um, I had an enemy to spearhead um, getting the Chief Justice to, um, um, uh, getting the Governor to look at diversity as a priority for the, the new Supreme Court. And we had an announcement last week that he appointed um, a new Chief Justice, Justice Seitz, but then the first ever African American um, Justice, uh, Tamika Montgomery Reeves. And that's something as counsel, we saw it as a problem, said, you know what, we're going to voice our concerns to focus on the big picture issues. So that's what we're working on, those kind of issues, and we want the, it to be a two-way street. Um, we get ideas from you all. And you want to finish? And yes, I, I really encourage you all to um, go to our website, WilmingtonCityCouncil.com. You can see the legislation that's coming forward. You can see how we are voting. You can see um, you know, what the legislation says. And we really welcome your input. Um, we are your voice. And we, we're always looking forward to hearing from you, which is why I had to come out of the ninth floor, out of that office, back to where I love, and that's being down in the community talking with the people. So thank you very much for coming out for our community conversations. Thank you. Thank you.